Good afternoon. I'm Peter Sharoshi, and this is uh, Stories from the Frontline uh, Drug Reporters live video series on uh, uh, harm reduction and activists who are telling us how this crisis affects uh, people who use drugs in their countries. Today, I have uh, two guests uh, with me from Norway, uh, uh, Ariel Nutzen from uh, the Association for Humane Drug Policy. He's a uh, community activist and a long time advocate for drug policy reform in Norway. And uh, Oystan Brun Eriksson, a social worker who works at the overdose prevention program operated by the uh, city of Oslo. Uh, so thank you guys for, for accepting our invitation. How are you? Thank you, thank how you. are you? Thanks for having me. Good. Um, so can you just uh, first, uh, Tell me something about uh, how, uh, how, how, how this crisis affects uh, uh, your lives uh, in general now. Are you at home or you're still working on the street? Me? Yeah, let's start with you, Ariel. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, wor the work in overall is the same as before COVID-19. The, there are still open drug scenes in the two largest cities and we are doing the same work as we did. Some a little less and some a little more. Yeah. And you, Einstein? Yeah, well, it's um, kind of the same kind of different for me because I'm, I'm mostly behind a desk these days. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of being down at the office uh, in the Velferdsetaten, I'm having a home office. So. I'm basically doing a lot of my work uh, from from my living room. So, um, but of course we might get back on it later. But uh, there are of course uh, some issues uh, coming from the COVID situation. Of course, mm -hmm. can you tell me about uh, the drug scene and the harm reduction scene in general in Norway? So, how how was that before the uh, crisis? What kind of services are available for drug users? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can maybe start on that one. Um, I guess um, we have uh, some open drug scenes, of course, downtown in Oslo and also in, in other municipalities uh, around the, the country. But maybe the main, main thing we should uh, have in mind is that Norway has a pretty broad welfare system, uh, which also include is helpful for also the users, uh, drug users, of course, but uh, it's pretty effective also also in in uh, a situa crisis situation like like this uh, and uh, there are a lot of public um, uh, harm reduction uh, facilities and outreach rich facilities um, governed by the by the municipalities and stuff like that so that's um, well, but also NGOs um, as well so uh, Ariad, how, how this uh, current epidemic affected uh, the lives of people who use drugs in Norway? Well, uh, the closing down of the society, the closing of the boards and everything has made some impact. Uh, we see that there are some uh, are less uh, cannabis in the market and uh, and many people who get heroin who live more stable lives out in outside the city center and so on they cannot get uh, they have shortage of heroin or amphetamine so they have to come into the city center to start to buy drugs from the open drug scenes and that makes the situation much worse for them of course it's more less stable and uh, of course it's a risky situation uh, with the virus and so on. Do you see any like shortages of drugs in the market or uh, rising drug prices? Yeah, rising drug prices, shortages of uh, uh, some drugs, some places at some times. Uh, it's very unstable. So many people come into the open drug scenes because they can't get drugs where they used to get it. And many people who use cannabis to uh, pr prevent using harder drugs. A lot of heavy drug users are coming to uh, opiate substitution treatment and, uh, and they can live stable, good with, with that and cannabis. And now they don't find cannabis anymore or have to pay 
uh, very high prices for it. So they start to use other drugs now. So we can see that in behavior, more addiction, more bad uh, mental health and so on. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, I would like to say just also that um, for me, not being as much in the front line anymore, I think it's hard to say too much about it. But of course, um, uh, as part of my work with the Re Re Regional Competence Center on Alcohol and Drugs, I participate and collect data every week from from um, municipalities in Norway who reports in on questionnaires uh, on changes, issues and challenges related to the corona situation and the drug scenes. Uh, this was launched by the, the Department of Health in Norway, so for, for a way to monitor the, the, the COVID situation in the open drug scenes uh, in Norway. Um, and uh, so far, I have to say that the main findings from these weekly reports is that few drug users are uh, at this point infected with the virus um, and also that the low threshold facilities both of the public ones but also the NGOs seems to have somewhat um, control of the situation at this point that is um, that does mean that that things couldn't be be even better but the impression is that a great share of the helping system has been able to uh, to some degree think and act pragmatic uh, on the challenges that has been caused by the by the epidemic um, but I mean it's it's a growing concern as well with the potential and as Ariel said uh, concerns about the drug drought uh, with with the borders being locked down um, and persists to be be locked down so this effect I mean will will probably uh, affect the, the whole drug scene, the facilities, the users and the personnel. Um, as it will be harder to get the, 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 the drugs you used to use and the dosages and stuff like that. So this might be, make it become more violence and distress and stuff like that will, will eventually might also be a big health concern with overdoses and stuff like that. So it is a growing concern with the, especially the um, potential uh, drug drought. Yeah, Oslo was once, it was dubbed like the uh, overdose capital of Europe and it had very high uh, rates of overdoses. Uh, what is the situation now? It's the same situation, but uh, there are a few reports of less overdoses during the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, this might lead to something good. And, and that, I think because many people fear uh, coming shortages of heroin, uh, more people want to seek treatment and treatment is available. So I think uh, a lot of people is taking more concern during, during this time and, and, and see that this is the time to actually uh, start to do something about their problems. In Norway, as far as I know, you have, you have two uh, drug consumption rooms. Are these uh, facilities open or closed or are they available for people? Unfortunately, they both are closed and they are still closed. And, uh, but this is up to uh, the politicians are considering now if they shall open a tent or, or find other buildings so that they can uh, open them again. This is so bad for the situation. People are sitting outside the drug consumption rooms and injecting out in the streets. And so that's not, uh, that's uh, very awful. But it has reached uh, political attention and we've re written a lot about it in the media. And this situation, it's a terrible situation, but this has really opened many people's minds about drug policy and that we have to have more health measures and less uh, ideology and more knowledge about what to do. So uh, there are more politicians now concerned about the drug uh, uh, consumption rooms and there are members of parliament going out in the media and focusing on the negative effects of shortage of drugs in the market. And also, um, the health authorities is now considering if we also now should try 
uh, have a tryout with giving out uh, substitution treatment also for those who's addicted to other drugs than heroin, like benzodiazepines and at least amphetamine. Hmm. Wow, that sounds interesting because it's like so few experiences we have from the world about uh, about stimulant uh, substitution. Uh, when when are you going? To, when when will the government uh, plan to you know open this program, or is there any 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 date for that? Yeah, uh, the health directory shall have a note ready now. I haven't seen it yet, but they are having a hearing, internal hearing first, and then they will give it out. And this is uh, primarily because we have great isolation units for drug users in Oslo and Bergen. I hope many more places. Uh, we, this is very this is very important. There are very few or no uh, COVID. Uh, infections among the drug, the problematic drug users in the open drug scenes and so on. But uh, so this is a very vulnerable group, but this is not a group that is dangerous to others. But uh, they have opened uh, two isolation units with very good uh, drug uh, competence and treatment competence and uh, morphine pills and methadone and buprenorphine and benzodiazepine so that they want to stay there. If they are testing positive, they can voluntarily go into these units. And of course, because of that, they know a lot of people is addicted to amphetamines, as addicted as people are addicted to heroin. So they can't give them op opiate substitution treatment. So they should give them the drug that they are addicted to. So therefore they have started to consider having amphetamine substitution treatment. And, and then also they are thinking about all those vulnerable people with 20 years shorter lives than others. What about them? Should they have to go down to the drug scene, get money very fast, inject amphetamine out in the street, or should they get amphetamine as medicine so that they can go home and take care just like everybody else? Yeah, yeah you know, Ariel, it's like so interesting to see that this crisis is just opening up new opportunities also, like not only closing, but also opening up things. Oysten, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I was just like to also say that it's really important in this situation to uh, have more uh, thoughts in the mind, uh, mind uh, at the same time, because uh, even though, the, of course, the COVID situation is really, really dramatic and really important to focus on, uh, we can't let it be so overwhelming that every other focus will just be pushed aside and, and for overdose prevention, you, you said, talk about Oslo being one of the, the the cities in Europe with most overdoses. I think it's really important that we, we still focus on, on uh, problems uh, with with that. And I know that uh, the the municipalities has been pretty pragmatic in, in uh, meeting the, the, um, the challenges coming from the COVID situation with as Ariel said, the isolation post and quarantine post in, in Oslo, which has demanded uh, some rearrangement in, in personnel. Uh, so that you have to shift some focus uh, throughout this situation, of course, but um, still, as long as we are in this situation with the corona, um, we the, the overdoses and the overdose deaths won't be set on pause until we find the solution. Uh, if anything, it might be even worse. So I think it's just really important that we, we keep on working with, with, uh, with other things as well. Mm -hmm. um, you were working on, on distributing naloxone, right? So uh, is that still working? So do you still distribute naloxone to people? Uh, yeah, yeah, we do. I mean, um, my job as a project coordinator is coordinating and, and uh, involving new municipalities and low threshold uh, facilities to make them able to, to distribute naloxone to the user groups. Um, and at this point, we are really eager and, um, and, and we see the importance of maintaining a high level of naloxone kit distribu distribution, uh, nasal spray, as we have in Norway. Um, 
And these days we have tried to be pragmatic and, and change the analog zone trainings a bit with focus more on how to minimize uh, risk of transmitting the disease uh, and a bit less on, on uh, what is the usual data collection part of the project. I mean, it's, it's a research project, so we, we have routines on, on collecting data, but when uh, in this situation, you, you're not supposed to be too close to people at too, too, too long a time. So, so we, we try to push the barrier to, to get the naloxones out uh, okay. at least for at this point. So you have like a, a protective measures such as masks and gloves, I, I suppose, at services. You know, I, I'm not quite sure how that is uh, at these times in, in Norway. Uh, it hasn't been that much, much discussed, I guess. But uh, I mean, the, the, the shelters and the, the low, low threshold sites and facilities are, are mostly it's still open and, and trying to, to, to do a good, good thing out of the situation. So I'm not, not quite sure about those measures. There are a lot of discussions also about, you know, testing, like COVID testing, uh, whether we need to test uh, people who live on the street or not. Do you have any position on that or do you have any opinion about that? Well, um, the, 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 in the city of Oslo and I, I know also Trondheim now these days, I uh, have started um, along with uh, NGOs, Sick Rapid uh, Nurses on Wheels, at least in Oslo, <laughs> started uh, COVID testing uh, in the drug scenes downtown in Oslo. I think that's a good measure for monitoring the situation. A lot of the people uh, in the drug scenes are in risk, risk groups for, for the corona. So I think that's a good, good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Ariel, what, what is happening with homeless people? Like, are there, are there good shelters for them? Is there no problem with overcrowding? You said that you have some good quarantine places. So that means that these, these places are uh, quite okay with, there is no overcrowding at these places? Uh, there's no overcrowding because there's a very little virus, if at all, among uh, people with heavy drug, bad drug uh, uh, addiction or people living on the street. But of course, the situation for people living on the street is not good enough. I know uh, many shelters were closed down in the beginning. And I, I read about a church that opened for, I think, with some 40 something people in one church. And of course, the hygiene situation is not good enough when 40 people sleep at one place with maybe one or two toilets or something like that. So uh, there has been some suggestions also from uh, politicians, mainly from Bergen in Oslo, that uh, homeless people should get to a, a hotel room each. And I really hope they could because uh, that would then we have their own bathroom. And, and uh, the politician also said that uh, we are we are expecting uh, heroin assisted treatment in Norway. It has just haven't been built up, but uh, it, it, they are soon ready to start up. And the politician in Bergen from the, the city council in Bergen, he said that uh, they uh, wanted that the homeless people and, uh, should come into the hotel room and get opiate substitution treatment, even uh, heroin assisted treatment to their hotel rooms. And I thought that was a very great, great idea. Actually, the, the Norwegian government was quite uh, progressive in drug policy even before this crisis. But what you are saying to me now, it sounds like maybe even this reform process can get accelerated by this crisis. Like new, new things can be introduced which were not uh, uh, proposed before. Is that the case? Yes. And as you say, we are in a drug policy reform time. We are uh, transferring, transferring the, uh, the responsibility from justice to health, decriminalization. But um, we, we really have this now because, uh, what do you call it, state uh, attorney office or something said to the police, uh, wrote a letter to the police just in uh, March saying that uh, um, crime that will lead to small response 
should not lead to any response at all. So use and possession of drugs is now decriminalized in practice. So that's, uh, that's great. And of course, when we are in a drug policy reform time, we can think about health measures and really what works, you know, like just say no. Uh, and we, we, we push out this just say no thinking uh, and come to a corona situation that uh, leads uh, media and politicians to understand better what to do and to be open to help in more ways than we have done before. Because there's a, there's a lot of irrational, um, uh, what do you say, irrational narrowing of helping drug users when the overall politic is to punish them. And now that we are starting to stop stopping punishing them, it opened up, opens up to see more ways of helping people with problematic drug use. So that was an under, undergoing uh, criminal reform in Norway. Will this crisis uh, stop this procedure or, or is it going according to the plans, how it was planned before? Yes, the policy, uh, the, the uh, progress is going on just like before. We are in a hearing, we are sending in letters about this report. You remember we were in Vienna and the health minister told about this in Vienna and the, the WHO and um, many special big organizations supported this. And this is getting known in Norway today and people are sending in their responses to this uh, drug reform report from punishment to help. I think, I think uh, there has been a pretty big shift over the last at least decade, but maybe five, six years in the um, public debate uh, regarding, uh, regarding the decriminalization. So I, I think we'll get there pretty soon. I really hope so. Um, I just want to say about, uh, about uh, the homeless people and the, the shelters, uh, I don't have the, the overview on everything on that uh, matter in the whole of Norway. But uh, as for us, I, it seems like most of the shelters has the same capacity as, uh, as earlier. And um, I know that the situation has forced the shelters and the personnel and residents there to think new, both with food serving, visitors, hours and, and stuff like that. But uh, they are mostly still open with somewhat the same capacity as before, at least in, in Oslo and the public ones. So I just, just want to say that. Okay. Uh, any news about you know, prisoners? What is happening in the prisons? That's a big problem in many countries. I don't know what's the situation in, in Norway. How many drug users do you have in prison? So is, is that a, a problem? I, I should probably do something about this as we collaborate with some of the prisons with an Alexon project, but um, I'm not really up to date on, on that uh, situation, I have to admit. So I don't know if you have heard anything about that, Ariel. I know a lot of people are concerned about the situation for uh, prison inmates. Of course, there's a lot of inmates that have drug problems and there's a, there are less drug treatment inside the prisons and there are fear that they might get a lot of COVID in, uh, in the prison, but I haven't heard of any measures to do anything about it. I wish they would, you know, people with short sentences and so on should be released now, if that's the best for them, of course. You mentioned this uh, stimulant uh, substitution uh, program. Do you think that it would uh, work the same way as, as, as it works with opiates or, or do you think there, are, there would be any, any changes or any, any, anything different with, with stimulant over, or, or, uh, uh, substitution or does it work in the same way as, as with opiates? Uh, in some ways, it will work the same way. Uh, so when the craving for drugs is as, a same, strong, as strong with amphetamines as to heroin, but the risk of dying of overdose is not as high. Uh, but of course, and I know a lot of people now with amphetamine problems. When they inject amphetamine for two, like two weeks, they start, they stop eating, they stop sleeping, they can get psychosis, they are having a bad time. And, and therefore they use heroin every now and then, and they very easily get um, uh, overdose. 
because they are not tolerant to heroin, they just use it now and then. And those people, they are putting, getting put into the opiate substitution treatment. So they are given a new addiction that they didn't have before, heroin, opiate addiction. So, and there are many more people injecting amphetamines than people who are injecting heroin. And where you get opiate substitution treatment, you see that there's a less, uh, a very smaller heroin market. But when the heroin market gets smaller, the amphetamine market takes over. So I think uh, the overall situation, I think this is the best thing you can do for problematic drug users to provide amphetamine central stimulants as uh, a substitution uh, medication. And of course, when you get the after some time, it's much easier to stop using the medication. Opiate substitution treatment, you are as addicted as you were to heroin when you were uh, in, the, in the open drug scenes. But with amphetamine medication, you get rid of the addiction by the medication. So I think this would be the best thing we can do in the drug treatment service. Okay. How do you see this, uh, the, the, let's say, how do you see the end of this crisis? Like, uh, you know, there is a lot of debate whether the, the world will go back to normal soon or will this crisis last for a longer time? Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? How do you see, do you, do you see the, the, the light in the end of the tunnel? Uh, I guess, um, I think it's really, weird that there aren't been any more positive tested COVID uh, on, on the user group um, so far, that there aren't more infected people. I, I don't really get why that is, but um, the, I mean, that, that's of course, that of course is a good thing. Um, in Norway now, we have had a pretty full lockdown as, as uh, many other countries, uh, but now we are, um, opening the society more uh, so I'm I'm, uh, I'm a bit worried and concerned about how that will affect uh, the, the, the drug user group as well because the, there will probably be more uh, infected people in the society and uh, that will probably have some um, will we'll have a role for the, the drug users as well so, and, and it will probably last for a long time, but who am I? I'm just a criminologist, so I don't, don't know about this, these kind of things. <laughs> yeah, how are you? I think we, uh, this is a good reason to be positive. We've been through the worst now, we know more, and we have uh, changed our way of uh, acting to others. There's a larger distance, we are better in hygiene, and we are thinking in other ways of working together. And, and I've really seen that the, 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 go the government, the health authorities, the competence centers, the scientists, the drug treatment workers, and those in low thresholds, and the drug user organizations, we are really working very good together now. We are seeing what's important and opening up to more ways of working. And I've seen like uh, the Soul Saver Army has started to hand out the drug user equipment. They've never done that before. So, and then so many people doing so fantastic work to protect the vulnerable people and drug users and people with drug problems. They are the most vulnerable group because if you have a chronic disease or you're, if you're very old, well, then you can lose a few years of your life if you get COVID-19. The, the people with problem, the problematic drug users, they can lose very many lives that could be prevented and they could have a decent and long and good life. So uh, I think everyone sees that this is very important to work with this. And the health minister, Ben Toye, last week, he gave 50, uh, approximately 5 million euro to the municipalities to work, to give even more help to those with uh, uh, problematic drug, pro uh, drug problems. Mm -hmm. Also, I have to say, I, I totally agree with Ariel. On, we see a lot of good collaborations coming you know, from the from the situation. Uh, people need to think pragmatic and, and be fast in the decisions. And I think we see a lot of good things coming uh, coming from that. Um, and as an uh, example, uh, just need to, to mention that um, 
that uh, there, there has been a this decentralization of syringe distribution in, in Oslo. Uh, so that the people who live out in the districts don't necessarily need to go downtown to the city center to get their equipment. Um, now there are 15 out of 15 districts in Oslo uh, distributing user equipment, and, and that has come to happen just over the last couple of weeks. So there are a, a lot of good things happening. So yeah, that's are... true. Uh, the harm reduction system is just growing throughout the country and very much uh, in and Oslo and around Oslo. More and more people are coming into the harm reduction family. Okay, so you sound quite optimistic that in the end of this crisis, uh, there will be more solidarity and uh, better services for, for people who are in need. Is there any other message, important message you want to uh, send to, to people who work in the field or policymakers or anything else? Look to Norway. We are in a drug policy reform, but there's, there's also problems and that's the cannabis users and also those, those who get it as medication. They are not being heard yet and they really should. That's a that's a, that's an awful situation. People with the mental health, with the pain, diseases, and they have to use bad drugs because they can't get cannabis as a medicine. Yeah, and use the situation. Uh, like I'm, I'm, I'm happy about um, the the um, directory of health who, in in Norway who initiated the Corona drugs questionnaire, as I, I, I talked about earlier. Uh, in order to monitor the situation, and um, that that's you get the information fast. So when there are any shifts or anything dramatic happening, we will hopefully see it fast. And I think that's a really good measure. Uh, and also keep more uh, thoughts in the mind. Uh, keep uh, working uh, working overdose prevention and stuff like that. Okay, thank you very much and thank you for accepting our invitation and we, you, that you were here with us. And also I thank for those who are watching us uh, on Facebook Live. Uh, please uh, keep following us on, on Facebook and Twitter so we, we can let you know about the next uh, episode of the Frontline, uh, Stories from the Frontline uh, series. Uh, and don't remember, stay safe and stay informed. Goodbye.